The metaverse has been everywhere lately, both for reasons that are intriguing and for reasons that are less so. Facebook's multi-billion dollar transformation into meta has been met with excitement in certain sectors, but skepticism pretty much everywhere else. So today we're tearing down the MetaQuest Pro to see what the cutting edge of Zuck's vision looks like on the inside and what separates this $1,500 device from the $400 Quest 2. And most importantly, will you be able to replace the battery, which reportedly only lasts for two hours once it inevitably dies? Thanks to the fine folks at Creative Electron, we can get an x-ray sneak peek of what we're about to find inside the headset. Lots of wires, lots of screws. It looks complicated in there. Meta is planning on selling the new controllers for $300. Now you do get a pair with your headset, which means that the headset is valued at about $1,200 by itself. The headset has the much hyped pancake lenses, hand tracking, eye tracking, facial feature tracking, and mini LED panels sporting 1800 by 1920 resolution per eye. Let's dig in and see if we're getting our money's worth. Virtual reality may be shiny and clean, but here in the meat space, we're shiny with sweat. Luckily, these cushions can be easily swapped out for cleaning after they've been soiled, thanks to the clips and magnets. The upper light blocker is also easily removed by undoing a set of screws and peeling the fabric away from its clips. A little force is all it takes to unclip the rear cushion, revealing a pair of recessed screws that hold the inner strap assembly. As we undo the five screws leading to the battery, we come across a tamper evidence sticker. It sure seems that Meta doesn't want you poking around in the hardware you just bought. With that, the battery housing can be separated from the head strap. A few more screws and a couple of plastic brackets later and we can see the mechanism for adjusting the head strap. This entire section comes away fairly easily, allowing us to fully separate the two sides of the headbands. As for the battery housing, well, surprise, one more plastic cover to remove here and a single connector cable. Disconnect it and the battery is free. This twin cell 20.58 watt hour battery is not only heftier than the Quest 2 single cell 14.3 watt hour battery, it's also curved. Bending batteries is typically the last thing that you would want to do, and while curved batteries are rare, we've seen them before. Placing the battery on the back of the headset is the key to the Quest Pro's world-class counterbalanced ergonomics. It makes the headset more comfortable to wear, and maybe more importantly, makes the battery easily accessible when you need to replace it. But it does beg the question, why didn't they make replaceable battery packs? Speaking of unreplaceable batteries strapped to your head, the Quest Pro features these two little flex cables, one for each cell, and based on the circuitry, we're wondering if they're meant to measure the flexing and swelling of the cells. Or could they be capacitive sensors? If you think you know what these are, please tell us in the comments. The next bits out are the cheek and nose rests, which seem to be much less replaceable than the other bits that rest against your head. Let's hope they clean up nice. Another tamper-proof sticker here tells us that Meta doesn't want us going past this point. Underneath these components, we spot our first of five IR cameras, but it turns out to be a teardown dead end. I opt to pop out the sidearm speaker grills next, and while they only seem to lead to a dead end, I take the opportunity to remove the speakers. This is a teardown after all, not a tear mostly down. At this point, I'm out of options and I'm forced to go for the front glass, which I find to my surprise is not glass. That's some shiny plastic. The glue runs deep with this device, and I'm just hoping I don't nick any cables as I insert a card to cut away the glue running all the way across the plastic. It gets pretty hairy for a bit, but the risk pays off. We're rewarded with an unobstructed view of the front assembly, and right away we can spot the location where the rumored time of flight sensor would have been if it hadn't been cut from the device during development. At this point, I'm gaining confidence that I can disassemble the device in one piece as I go around removing every screw that may be a structural support. I was stuck going around in circles for nearly two hours at this point, how the heck do we get to the main board? Frustration finally gives in and I yank the front plastic support off. And to my surprise, it turns out to be the answer to the riddle. What seems like far too many screws later, we can finally remove the remaining outer plastic. Once we remove this USB-C port and these two screws. That's it for this side for the time being. Time to turn the device back over and continue the teardown from the lens side. Removing the lens assembly is now a simple matter of undoing several screws and removing the lens and display panel assembly on each side. With the ocular components out the way, we're greeted by not one but two fans placed directly underneath each panel. Those things must run hot. This is the point of no return. Disassembling the lens from the panels will end this device until we can obtain spare parts. 
the teardown gods must be appeased. With each section separated, we can take a closer look at the core improvement to this device, and perhaps the sole reason I'd even contemplate spending $1,500 on this thing, eye tracking in all its gory glory. And of course, the pancake lenses that deliver such a crisp and clear, not to mention headache-free VR experience, coupled with the mini LED panels that bring it all together. It appears that these lenses are entirely made of high-index plastic, not glass as one might expect. That's probably because the plastic is easier to mold, cheaper to produce, and weighs less than glass alternatives. We return to the front side of the device and find that two little plastic bobbly bits are hiding a pair of screws securing the mainboard and cameras. This thermal paste is a good indicator that the system on chip is nearby and the heat pipes are a dead giveaway too. Removing the heat sink gives us a nice view of the mainboard with the Qualcomm Snapdragon XR2 Plus front and center. With the headset in pieces, we turn our attention to the Meta Pro's controllers. These are the MetaQuest Pro controllers, formerly known as Project Starlet, and they're interesting in their own right. Each one sports its own Qualcomm Snapdragon 662 SoC, which is processing positional data from three integrated cameras. This results in better hand tracking and positional accuracy. In addition to all this, each controller has three haptic feedback engines, one of which is integrated inside the trigger. The end result is a pair of controllers that aid the overall immersive experience. Let's take a peek inside to see how they achieved this. After some gentle probing, we proceed to work our way around the face of the controller to see if there's any give around there. Sure enough, the entire section is glued on. There's a single ribbon cable to deal with and the circular plate comes away. A few screws, a single bracket and a couple of springs are next. This corner camera is my next victim as it seems the most likely to come away from the rest of the board. The plastic supporting structure is now ready to be lifted away, revealing two ribbon cables, the second one of which connects to one of the two side-mounted cameras. With both cameras removed, it's time to move on to the thumbstick assembly. Replacing this thumbstick shouldn't be too big a headache if it starts to drift. Opening it up reveals that it's the same type of potentiometer-based thumbsticks found in the Nintendo Switch consoles. A brush slides across this resistive element here which then results in an output corresponding to the position of the brush. The analog buttons are unremarkable with a tried and true construction common across most controllers. Let's take a moment to examine this lever here, which has a magnet attached to it, a sure sign that we have a hole sensor nearby. Turns out that what the manual calls a thumb pad is actually a button. Pressing on the thumb pad also moves two larger magnets, which in turn manipulate the magnet on the lever, causing it to move. Let's dig a little deeper. This cable should be the battery ribbon cable, and we have another two cables that are connected to two haptic engines. A single antenna cable and three screws later, and we can lift the main PCB away from the rest of the plastic body, revealing another ribbon cable and one more connector cable. At this point, I can finally see the last clip holding the two halves of the plastic handle together. This also clears enough space for me to remove the trigger mechanism. Taking a look inside, we can see the single haptic engine embedded in the trigger. Right next to our haptic engine inside the trigger is a single magnet, which indicates that this is a hole sensor trigger, as is the side trigger. Both these triggers will be able to detect whether they're being fully depressed or partially depressed. There's a single voice coil motor haptic engine in each controller, and I'm guessing this is it. BCMs provide a richer haptic response, which translates to a more nuanced output of vibrations. Finangling a few more cables and screws allows us to remove the battery and its plastic housing in one piece. This lithium ion battery is rated for 10.85 watt hours. Last but not least, we have access to our pressure sensor that doubles as a stylus pen. Interestingly enough, this doesn't appear to be a pressure sensor at all, but a simple analog push button. Pressing on the rubber pad connects the two points and completes this circuit. Simple and effective. The MetaQuest Pro is such a complex device that the assembly process no doubt contributed to the eye-watering price tag. 146 screws, tons of cables, and what at times seemed like a counterintuitive design made this teardown one of the hardest we've done in a long time. On the repairability front, while we can praise Meta for mainly using Philips head screws, opening a device of this complexity will almost certainly eat up hours of time for anyone planning to do anything other than a battery replacement. But the replaceability of that battery is also commendable, and a major improvement over the Quest 2 battery replacement process. While there's a ways yet to go, many horizons that need to be explored, if you will, 
it's a fascinating, if largely unfixable device. May well be that, at least for now, the Quest Pro's teardown verse is more interesting than the metaverse.